So thank you. Uh, like I said, we're going to be talking about an app. This is an app we've been developing um, for our soybean producers. I'm going to go over a little bit about why we're developing it and kind of the process that we've had as far as doing a research project. We're going out and you know, how do you find funding for it? How do you set this thing up? And what ideas do you have uh, so that you can actually create a useful project out of it? Um, then Ricky's going to talk a lot more about how you do the multi-platform development because as we started working on this project, uh, that was obviously very important. Um, so beginning, first I'm like said, I'm going to talk about creating the app. Uh, so what's the problem? Kentucky producers uh, harvest their grain at high moisture content. I'm sure you've heard um, Aaron where he is. Yeah, he's talked about uh, you know that's a lot of his projects about harvesting high moisture grain. Why do you do that? Uh, well, you're trying to get your grain harvested early so that you don't have to worry about anything like a, uh, a hailstorm come through and knock all the grain out of the ground where you can't pick it up or you, any other kind of problem happen. Also, it can turn off wet and you're never harvested for days. Uh, and there's just a chance that it just starts falling out. So you want to harvest it as fast as possible. Uh, yeah, out further west, it doesn't really matter because if you wait one day, it will drop from this 20% down to 14. So that's why wheat harvest in Kansas and Oklahoma never gets harvested wet uh, because it just makes no sense to not wait that extra day. But in Kentucky, we're hard, especially for harvesting like corn and soybeans, like right now or last month, usually it's kind of Usually, not this year, it's usually wet and cool, uh, or at least cooler, so the crop's not drying down very fast. So you need to, so they, you know, it could be two weeks where it's in this range. So they want to go ahead and get started, and they harvest it wet. The problem is, uh, if you have a harvest with high moisture content, you can't store it, so you've got to get the moisture content down. Um, and that's so that you can store it. So that ends up, you're going into a grain dryer, you're going to have to dry it somewhere or somehow. And the other thing is if you start harvesting, I guess if you started at 14% and you kept harvesting during your two week harvest window or whatever, by the time you got done with harvest, you might be harvesting 8% beans. And that happened last year. Your discount for harvesting 8% beans is enormous because you think about it, you had 14% moisture in that bean at one time. Now it's down to 8%. You've lost uh, 5%. Uh, just that water that just evaporated out. So that was extra that you could have charged for because that water weighed something. So you're giving up money when you're harvesting at 8% because the elevator will pay you up to 14% moisture. I've heard of guys who when it got really dry, they started parking their trucks in barns with the tarp over and started running garden hoses into it, trying to get the moisture back up right before they dropped it off. Uh, <laughs> trying to do anything, of course, you know, that doesn't really do much for yeah, it takes a long time. Uh, or they'll try and capture dew, they'll harvest at certain times, just so that they don't give up that money. It's a huge uh, discount. I mean, they're, they're, I think it was like a 10% loss if they're harvesting at 8%. So that's another reason why they want to start early. Problem is though, if you start early, you have to dry. You can do this on farm or you can do it at the elevator. Elevators, sometimes they'll mix wet and dry grain. So if you harvest, if you start at 20%, by the time you're done, you might be down around uh, 14 or maybe down about 8 or 10. You know, it could get down that low. So all they need to do is mix the two types of grain and that will uh, average out. And it's kind of tricky on how you do it exactly, but they go for that sometimes. Other times, the elevators just dry it. So when you take it to an elevator, they're going to assign discounts. They're picking up everything. Um, you might have a foreign matter discount. You might have something with broken grain. Moisture is the one we're talking about here. So when you go to an elevator, I'll show you a discount schedule real quick. Um, this is one from ADM in Silver Grove, Kentucky. You'll notice here that you've got, if your test weight's not correct, you're going to get a discount. This is for soybeans. Uh, if the moisture is above 13%, they add a discount. Uh, there's heat damage. They have discounts for that. How do you? Quantified heat damage. I am not sure, but they have it all listed. I noticed that. <laughs> I'm not used to that one either. I just noticed they had it there. Uh, Scorched. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Anything 
damage above 10% will be discounted. I don't know if they, if you fall in grain, you drive too close to burner. I'm not sure where you get the damage. That one I'm not familiar with, but this is like total damage where you have something like cracked kernels. Well, here's the split. Uh, if you split them 20% um, below, that's no discount, but after you go above a certain number of split kernels, they start charging you. And so they have all these different things they discount you for. And most of these kind of fairly straightforward. And farmers, when they start harvest, they'll go ahead and call up every single elevator they're planning to deliver to at the beginning of the year and ask them for their current discount schedules because this is important. If they if they're, think there might be an issue with something in their harvest, maybe they're harvesting in a certain variety and they're getting lots of splits just because of the weather um, condition. You want to see who's not going to penalize those splits as bad, and you're going to halt to that person. So. These are very important, even though this is not the primary thing you see. When you look at an elevator, you're going to see a price. They're just going to stick that in the window. Um, so getting back to elevators. The one thing interesting I should mention right here about the moisture. You'll notice what basically what's going on here. It's about a 2% dock uh, for every percent over 13. So you'll notice that um, right here when you get to 15%, you're at a 4% dock. So that's how they're doing the discount. You can do it in lots of different ways. There are other people that will do like maybe four cents off per bushel um, per percent moisture content. You also have people that use shrink and dry equations. So every elevator does this differently. Some people have that 2% number, some might only have 1.5%. It kind of depends on the elevator setup. If they have a really good dryer that's cheap, well they might not penalize you as bad. If they're counting on lots of mixed grain, so they don't really care if they get a lot of wet grain because they're going to mix it. Somehow they know they're guaranteed some dry grain. Uh, you know, they might not discount it hardly at all. So that's some of the issues here. And why are we looking at an app? Well, base prices vary. Every elevator, so you go to Winchester, I mean, you can look up the prices right now. Winchester is basically our closest elevator here. They're going to be usually fairly low price because they don't have much competition. You go over to Western Kentucky, there's elevators all around, but every elevator, even elevators owned by the same company, they will have maybe five, 10 cent difference um, per bushel uh, on what they're offering the grain. And that's just based on you know what their availability is, where they're going to sell it, how much it costs to transport it. If the trains are full right now because they're hauling oil, well then they can't haul uh, grain. So if you're on a uh, train terminal, they'll end up you know, paying less for at that elevator versus one that's on a river terminal where they know they have barges. So there's very different base prices. Base moisture, if you're going to go to some place that's going to maybe grind for feed, they might take it at 15% moisture because they don't care about the moisture as much and they're not going to store it as long. If you're going to food grade, they might want like 13% moisture. So they're a lot pickier when you're going into food grade. Um, and then, like I said, the discount type and level varies. Every elevator will change that. And farmers, for them, the net price, that's the price they're going to get per bushel. So they drop, they drive their truck to the elevator, they drive across the scales, they take the sample, the elevator then writes down all the discounts and says our market price right now is this, that it's be their spot price, and they say they'll pay the farmer this much. Uh, and that's the net price. And you also have to, besides all the stuff from the market price and the discounts, the farmer also has to consider the transportation costs. He's hiring a semi, he's driving it somewhere. Sometimes it makes sense to drive an extra hour to go to an elevator that has, for some reason, a much better um, price than some place that's close by. And you'll see a lot of producers do that. Um, that's a big, uh, a big consideration. Obviously, all these variables, it's not feasible to do that while you're sitting in the field. Um, moisture content can vary day to day, and so you start harvesting, it's pretty wet, then as it dries down, uh, it gets less. Maybe you have more trucks one day than another day, so <coughs> you couldn't consider hauling all the way to Owensboro, but now all of a sudden you can, uh, because you got into a place where maybe the yield's a little lower and you're not using as many trucks. So that's why um, you might end up using an app. Uh, Creating the app. The idea came from extension agents. So producers were talking to extension agents about a problem they had. They said, we can't figure this out on our own. Uh, we're interested in doing something. So we worked with uh, Jordan Shockley and Sam Camille. 
on a spreadsheet. So this is the spreadsheet. You can see it takes into consideration all the different ways uh, you can um, calculate different discount methods. We have to have all this input based on like what's your average truck speed, how far are all these elevators from you. And using that, we can actually give them this net price received down here. And we can say, hey, best buyer you should go to is buyer two. So then that, that's the one that's giving you the highest price. And that's, uh, you know, this is a basic um, idea of what we're looking for. And it kind of captured all the equations. We went back and forth talking about those equations quite a bit. We, I also ended up taking a uh, student that built an app for a 305 project for the semester project and had him create an initial version of the app. So this is an Android only because that's what we had, um, we were able to use without having to pay for anything. And we created the Android app and that got the soybean board interested. So the soybean board said, hey, it looks like you have a decent app and this is the problem our producers um, are facing. This Kentucky Soybean Promotion Board is a board that's composed of soybean producers and they collect money from all the soybeans that are sold in the state and that's how they, uh, they give money out for research projects that directly help their producers. So the producers are deciding what they want to spend money on. And they like the idea so they said, hey we'd like you to build it. Uh, Ricky will talk about the initial app we created. We started sharing with producers this fall, and we got some really interesting feedback. We'd gone back and forth on these equations quite a bit. We started talking to one producer, he goes, um, how are you going to include the toll on the Louisville Bridge now? Oh. Because, yeah, um, for everything on this side of the state, uh, the year there's a terminal in Louisville for consolidated grain, um, consolidated bargaining grain, Let's see here, consolidated grain and barge. And there's another one directly across the river, um, in Indiana, in Jeffersonville. That's the one that'll, that's the large one. That will take the wet grain. The one that's in Kentucky on our side of the river is just a very small terminal and it's just used for loading barges directly. So if they're gonna haul wet grain, they, or if they really wanna haul lots of grain, they're gonna have to haul it across that bridge. So now there's a toll, and I think it's like $12 for a semi. So it's not trivial and it adds a lot to their cost. And they're, you know, it's, takes like that's you know an employee for an hour so maybe it makes sense to drive the long way around um, I'm not sure about how that would work out depends on how bad the guy needs the truck uh, so we've got issues with that we are we talked to farmers that some guys had different ways they wanted to calculate it so what's interesting is we looked at it from engineering economic standpoint this is what makes sense producers are coming back with well this is how we actually work with it uh, another thing the producers, um, they are, we're still working on some of their feedback. We're just doing surveys right now, so I don't have all the details. <clears throat> one thing about it, uh, I think everyone we have talked to so far uses iPhone. No one uses Android, um, which is why we need to do the, make sure we do the cross-platform development. We could go straight Apple, but there will be enough people that want Android that I think we ought to at least support it. Uh, and then, a lot of them were actually very interested in it. One of the things we were worried about is the fact that the base prices for every elevator changes every day, actually sometimes multiple times per day. So we were afraid that we to have the base price information because you can't do this calculation without the base price. So uh, we were trying to figure out how do we actually support this, how do we host the base price uh, so that it can, the app can access it. There's lots of little apps and other things, services that you can use to track that down. Uh, but one of the things the farmer said is actually don't worry about that. Those numbers are just kind of the um, base case and kind of based on what's out there right now, we don't actually get the numbers that, th that those apps are showing because we all know the, the uh, elevators and one guy goes, yeah, I always get a couple cents better. I mean, because I call up and I'll talk to them. If they know it's me, they will quote a higher price than someone else. Just because he's a large producer and he'll haul a lot of grain there. Some guys actually will have a contract before harvest, they're going to haul so many bushels of grain and they will get a bonus for it uh, to one producer or to one elevator. So the price thing ended up, that was what we were really afraid of. They didn't care because they said it's worse to have, um, it's, way, it's worse to have a bad price uh, than to not have price at all. He goes, and we're used to having to 
calculate our own price in there. So it won't be a problem if you have to if you ask us to type in the price when we're actually considering elevators. So Ricky will, I guess, demonstrate the app. Um, if you have any questions on how this whole grain delivery thing works, so, I'll answer them now. So the farmers were more interested in having the computation done for them instead of just kind of sort of doing it in their head? Yes. Instead of having to gather the prices? Yeah. Uh -huh. Price gathering was not a huge They're more comfortable deal. doing that than deciding, oh, I'm going to make more money if I go here. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, figuring out the, the moisture, because uh, it, it's so opaque to them. One guy does a percent off, one guy does four cents off. You know, then someone else has a shrink and dry thing that has two versions of the equation. And we actually typed in one of the nearby elevators uh, into our app when we were going to talk to him. And the producers started kind of laughing. They're like, oh man, that's, Burgess is always getting us on that. Because it, it did show that if they delivered wet grain to, I don't know, if it was Burgess or not, so. Um. But they had a slightly <laughs> different way of calculating the. the yeah, it hit hard. It was, it was like, the other guys were maybe 10 cents off per bushel. That one was 25 cents off per bushel. I mean, it was amazing compared to like ABM and those other guys. Uh, and the producers, yeah, I think they were using strength dry at Burgess or whatever it was. And, you know, that's one where it's two sets of equations, two different discounts that get added together. And the producers really couldn't um, do that in their head while they're sitting in the field. And, but they always kind of knew that, they, they laughed at it because they go, this guy's always picking on the green. He's always trying to find a way to get us. And he's like, I'm glad you're showing us this and this discount here because this is really what we... They sort of knew see. it, but they didn't have it in her back. Yeah, and they, they definitely could not do this transportation. That's the thing that Apple actually will talk about, but it, it actually looks up the distance on the roads. So if you're in one field, you can actually look at what the discounts are for there. I mean, these guys, the big producers are in multiple counties. Yeah, they're the ones that are really using this. So it could be that this set of elevators is closer here and this other set of elevators is closer there. And so that's where, you know, there's multiple pieces here that they can't realistically calculate. So, yeah. so did you end up talking to ABM or Consolidated or was it really just producer driven? And is there a time when you would talk to those industry partners? Uh, this is all producer driven because they're funding it and they're asking for it. Now, I, did, I have called ABM, Consolidated Grade and Barge, uh, because they're the ones that give us the discount schedules. I call them up, and actually, I talked to Consolidated Grade and Barge, it's like, oh, this is awesome. Let me give you a spreadsheet I've created and I share with all my producers talking about this. And, and he was saying, you know, he had the spreadsheet filled out, and it was like, for corn, it's not too bad if you deliver dry grain versus wet grain. The discounts are the same, but for, I think, of soybeans, it was like uh, maybe, you know, if you looked at that, that 20% discount was maybe uh, 15, uh, whatever it was, it was, it was whatever percent it was there, it was about four times worse to deliver 8% beans than it was to deliver 20% beans. So he was trying to get it out to the producers, hey, deliver early, deliver wet, we'll dry it. You're losing more money if you deliver dry, even though you don't see it on the discount schedule. So. I was kind of surprised. I was uh, I was worried some of the elevators might be hostile because yeah. we're, you know, we're helping them, helping <laughs> the farmers. Yeah, we're helping yes. the farmers figure out which elevator is giving the best price. But at the same time, the elevator, you know, everyone I've talked to was like, oh yeah, I mean, farmers should know the discount schedule and if you give it to them an easier way to use. Then we're all for it. Um, so I, I was pleasantly surprised. They've been incredibly helpful. Yeah. Right now we're going through, the one thing they did want is the producers wanted every spring for us, or right before harvest, to call all the elevators and get the discount schedules and put them in the app. So they did want one thing maintained and that was the discount schedule to make the app useful. That's a once a year thing, probably won't take more than a few hours. We're going to figure out how, how we're going to get that budgeted, but the producer boards were already talking. I can talk the weak guys into giving you <laughs> the funding for one year to do that, you know, or it's whatever it was, so that they can keep the the thing updated. Um, but that that is a concern. So that is the one thing they did want to update every year. Anything else? Yes. How many of your your elevators are out of state? The people that 
I'm only talking to in-state. Oh, I guess, of course, you have to consolidate Granite Barge. It's in Jeffersonville, Indiana, so. Okay. Is uh, that a concern with producers out west or the people all in north south? They do. I guess the river is cutting off the north, but. Yeah, the, I don't think they're going north very often. We actually have, um, Farm Bureau kind of puts out a daily price update that captures like the top 15 elevators or so. And Jordan Shockley has the, uh, in the AgiCon, he's created one that has all delivery points that defined in the state, or that this people in the state use, and it includes some places down in Tennessee, because that's actually, um, unfortunately, they don't like it's in Fort Campbell, that's in the port, border, or what's on what, the west side? Uh, below the Land of Lakes, what is that? It's the fort and the, oh, whatever it is over there, it's apparently really hard to drive through, but it is sometimes worth it because the Tennessee price can be very good. So that, that is one of those places we're going to have to include. I was kind of surprised there weren't more, but if, I guess it kind of stays in our area. Miles takes his stuff to Indiana. Does he go to through Owensboro or does he go up to, where's he going? He's going up to somewhere in the middle of, middle of Indiana, like two hours away. <laughs> wow. Of course, he's a, kind of unique in some ways. <laughs> yeah, uh, although some of these producers aren't much smaller than him, but they, uh, he, he also pre-sells a lot of it, right? Yep. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious what he's going to have, but uh, I, I, he did sound like this would be the solution he's looking for. So not every producer can use this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is more of like a question with the app. So since farmers are really going to use this once a year, kind of, or at least during that time frame when they're harvesting, yeah. is there an issue with, like, every year that this app, like, you're only going to have, like, troubleshooting and stuff issues with it during that one time a year, like, maintaining it, you know what I mean, and, like, updates every year? Yeah. Because people aren't constantly using it and telling you, hey, there's issues with this. Is, is what you guys think about it? That will be a challenge. Uh, you have wheat harvest. Well, we're developing this for soybean harvest. So technically, yeah, so this is a soybean app and use it for yeah. anything else. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what the soybean board <laughs> But the guys in the soybean board are like, we harvest corn. So can I type my corn prices in? I'm like, yes. <laughs> and he goes, and they're like, don't tell anyone else you said that. Um, and then, yeah. So there, well, actually, I guess probably have three times wheat, corn, so we harvest corn, so we're kind of coming, but it does kind of spread that out. So there's like two months in the fall, or, you know, June. Um, yes, that is definitely a challenge. And one thing is that we're, we did this testing this fall, and I'm glad we hadn't tried to post what we had. You know, it worked fairly well, but the feedback, based on feedback we got, we really want to do another iteration and have it ready for the guys. Yeah, and I guess Ricky can talk about more of the how this works with all the apps is you I mean you can create a stable app and it works fine, but then they change the back end on you and Yeah, that's that's what I was saying. Yeah. Because every year they come out with a new update of the Android version or Apple version, you know. So And a lot of times you're backward compatible. Oh. Um like I created an app five years ago. It still works. Oh okay. it still looks decent because I managed to I wrote the code in such a way that it just whatever the newest buttons are in Android it just populates in to oh. the app. Yeah, yeah, I don't I didn't do any kind of special um, anything special, so that's how we got it. Okay, I'm gonna let Ricky go. I don't see anything else. Oh, so this here is a bit, that's one discount schedule. Give you an idea of what else might be. This is a different discount schedule. Um, you can see they list it slightly differently. Oats must be sour. You know, like fermented. Yeah. So anyhow, it, it's so when you're looking at these things, it's kind of hard to judge them based on each other. There we go. Now Ricky's going to talk about how you have to do this building these multi-platform apps. Yeah, and kind of give you an idea of what to think about if you're thinking about developing an app and what you'll be looking at and effort that you'll probably <coughs> guess have to pay for <laughs> in some way to get the app done.
<laughs> 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 type of guy. <laughs> So kind of what we're looking at, I'm going to talk about types of apps, the pros and cons of those apps, uh, use cases for those apps, um, and then we're going to kind of lean into hybrid um, app development, which uh, Joe kind of touched on, and then the platform that I use to uh, port those apps over to a native app, so Cordova and PhoneGap, and then Ionic is kind of a framework that's used for the UI development and also um, some of the HTML functionality that you'll use for um, kind of displaying and storing um, your models for your data. And then I'll do a little demonstration. All right, so apps. So does anybody have an idea of what types of apps there are out there? I'll give you a hint. There are three types. No. <laughs> Easy to use, hard to use. <laughs> <laughs> I know some of you all know because you all know from year five, but did you want to take my class? Oh, well, let's ask them if they took their class. <laughs> 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 yes. So, when we'll. Got guess, Chris? I said so. We'll put it on Alright. So, we have native apps, web apps, and hybrid apps. So we're going to kind of dive deeper into each one of those. But of course, a hybrid app is a combination of a native app and a web app. <laughs> so, yeah, so native apps. So native apps are platform specific. So you know, you have your iOS. Um, if you're going to write an iOS app, then you're definitely going to be writing in Objective-C or Swift. Um, most people probably so have is heard that a, is that a um, program. iPhone? Yeah, yeah, iOS, iPhone, yeah. Um, and I mean, it's pretty much the same for Mac or any, any Apple platform that you want to write. But, um, yeah, Objective C or Swift, they've been shifting more towards Swift lately over Objective C. Um, and Swift is more, uh, I guess you would say, it's like JavaScript a little bit. But um, and if you're writing an Android app, you're looking at Java. Um, a lot of people learn Java in undergrad. Unfortunately, well, not, I don't, I'm not going to say unfortunately, but UK teaches Python and C++. <laughs> instead of Java in undergrad. And then a Windows there using C Sharp and a little bit of JavaScript. They're kind of leaning into more uh, JavaScript, but it's not widely used for Windows development uh, for their native platforms. Um, so the good thing about developing a native app is you have access to all the device's features, such as the camera, the accelerometer, the gyroscope, um, I mean, on and on all the features um, because it's built for that platform. So they're going to give you as much access as they possibly can. Um, notifications, so push notifications, bat battery life notifications, um, email notifications. Um, you're going to have access to all of that also um, when you're developing a native app. Offline access to your app. Uh, if you're using them, well, I'll go into that later, but offline access. So you don't have any internet connection. You're out in the middle of nowhere. You can still use the app and its capabilities. And the apps are distributed through the App Store. So you got the App Store <laughs> for iOS, the Google Play Store for Android, and I'm not sure what the Windows <laughs> App Store is called. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft yeah. Store, I think. Microsoft Store. Yeah. Don't. I've never used a Windows phone to be honest. Um, we would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have your web apps. So web apps aren't really <coughs> apps per se. They're basically mobile friendly websites. So I'm pretty sure you've all used like the Macy's app or something like that where you just you type in the name of the URL and it pops up with the M dot whatever. That's kind of a, that's a web app. So they just made a website mobile friendly and made it look like it's a, an app. Um, those are typically written in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So HTML is kind of the backbone of everything, displaying your document, um, per se. And JavaScript is kind of the engine that's kind of running everything. If you have any calculations or um, any fancy animations or anything that's typically done in JavaScript, and then your CSS is kind of your design. So how something's going, the color of something, uh, how it's going to transition, and things like that. So. Um, the good thing about web apps is cross-platform use. I mean, every phone, everybody has a browser. So 
you can access that as long as you have uh, internet access. <coughs> That's the um, good thing about 